Hi guys, welcome back to chapter 20. If you remember from yesterday, the memory that the giver wanted to give Jonas, the last really good thing before he goes, um, is music, the giver said smiling. I began to hear something truly remarkable and it's called music. I'll give you some before I go. Jonas shook his head empathetically. No, giver, he said, I want you to keep that to have with you when I'm gone. Jonas went home the next morning, cheerfully greeted his parents, and lied easily about what a busy, pleasant night he had had. His father smiled and lied easily, too, about his busy, busy and pleasant day the day before. Throughout the school day, as he did his lessons, Jonas went over the plan in his head. It seemed startlingly simple. Jonas and the giver had gone over and over it late into the night hours. For the next two weeks, as the time for, for the December ceremony approached, the giver would transfer every memory of courage and strength that he could to Jonas. He would need those to help him find where the elsewhere that they were both sure existed was. They knew it would be a very difficult journey. Then, in the middle of the night before the ceremony, Jonas would secretly leave his dwelling. This was probably the most dangerous part because it was a violation of a major rule for any citizen not on official business to leave a dwelling at night. I'll leave at midnight, Jonas said. The food collectors will be finished picking up the evening meal remains by then, and the path maintenance crews don't start <clears throat> their work that early, so they won't be able, there won't be anyone to see me, unless, of course, let's see, Rusty won't to listen to this too. Okay, there we go, Doc. Unless, of course, someone is out on emergency business. I don't know what you should do if you're seen, Jonas, the giver had said. I have memories, of course, of all kinds of escapes. People fleeing from terrible things throughout history, but every situation is individual. There's no memory of one specifically like this. I'll be careful, Jonas said. No one will see me. You're not a teacher until you can read, do a read aloud with a dog in your lap. <laughs> As receiver in training, you're held in very high respect already, so I think you wouldn't be questioned very forcefully. I just say I was on some important errand for the receiver. I'd say it was all your fault and that, that you were out after hours, Jonas teased. They both laughed a little nervously, and Jonas was certain that he could slip away unseen from the house, carrying an extra set of clothing. Silently, he would take his bicycle to the riverbank and leave it there, hidden in the bushes, with the clothing folded beside it. Then, he would make his way through the darkness, on foot, silently, to the annex. There's no nighttime attendant, the giver explained. I'll leave the door unlocked, and you, slim, you simply slip into the room. I'll be waiting for you. His parents would discover, when they woke, that he was gone, and they would also find a cheerful note from Jonas on his bed, telling them that he was going for an early morning ride along the river, that he would be back for the ceremony. His parents would be irritated but not alarmed, they would think him inconsiderate, and they would plan to chastise him later. They would wait with mounting anger for him, finally, and they would be forced to go, taking Lily to the ceremony without him. They won't say anything to anyone, though, Jonas said, quite certain. They won't call attention to my rudeness because it would reflect on their parenting. And anyway, everyone is so involved in the ceremony they probably won't notice that I'm not there. Now that I'm a 12 and in training, I don't have to sit with my age group anymore. So Asher will think that I'm with my parents or with you. And your parents will assume that you're with Asher or me. Jonas shrugged. I'll take, it'll take everyone a while um, to notice that I'm not there at all. And you and I will be long on our way by then. In the early morning, the giver would order a vehicle and drive from the and, and driver from the speaker. He would he visited the other communities frequently, meeting with the elders. His responsibilities extended over there, all over there, all over all the surrounding areas. Excuse me. So this would not be unusual, an unusual undertaking. 
Ordinarily, the giver did not attend the December ceremony. Last year, he had been present because of the occasion of Jonas's selection. Last year, he had been present because of the occasion of Jonas's selection, in which he was so involved, but his life was usually quite separate from that of the community. No one would comment on his absence or on the fact that he had chosen this day to be away. When the driver and vehicle arrived, the giver would send the driver on some brief errand, and during his absence, the giver would help Jonas ride in the storage area of the vehicle, or hide, excuse me, in the storage area of the vehicle. He would have with him a bundle of food, which the giver would save from his own meals during the next two weeks. The ceremony would begin with all the community there, and then Jonas and the giver would be on their way. By midday, Jonas's absence would become apparent and would be a cause for serious concern. The ceremony would not be interrupted. Such a disruption would be unthinkable. But searchers would be sent out in the, into the community. By the time his bicycle and clothing were found, the giver would be, would be returning. Jonas, by then, would be on his own, making his journey elsewhere. The giver, on his return, would find the community in a state of confusion and panic, confronted by a situation which they had never faced before, and having no memories from which to find either solace or wisdom, they would not know what to do and would seek his advice. He would go to the auditorium where the people would be gathered still, and he would stride to the, sa the stage and command their attention. He would make the solemn announcement that Jonas had been lost in the river and he would immediately begin the ceremony of loss. Jonas, Jonas, they would say loudly, as they had once said the name of Caleb, and the giver would lead the chant. Together, they would let Jonas's presence in their lives fade away as they said his name in unison more slowly, softer and softer, until he was disappearing from them, until he was no more than an occasional murmur by them. I, and then, by the end of that long day gone forever, not to be ever mentioned again. Their attention would turn to their overwhelming task of bearing the memories themselves. The giver would help them. Yes, I understand that they'll need you, Jonas had said at the end of the lengthy discussion and planning, but I'll need you too, please come with me. He knew the answer even as he made his final plea. My work will be finished, the giver had replied gently, when I have helped the community to change and become whole. I'm grateful to you, Jonas, because without you, I would have never figured out a way to bring about the change. But your role now is to escape, and my role is to stay. But don't you want to be with me, Giver? Jonas asked sadly. The Giver hugged him. I love you, Jonas, he said, but I have another place to go. When my work here is finished, I want to be with my daughter. Jonas had been st staring glumly at the floor, and now he looked up startled. I didn't know you had a daughter. Giver, you told me that you'd had a spouse, but I never knew that you had a daughter. The giver smiled and nodded. For the first time in their long months together, Jonas saw him look truly happy. Her name was Rosemary. The giver said, wow, I didn't know that. He drained his daughter. She asked to be released. Wow. Chapter 21. It would work. They could make it work. Jonas told himself again and again throughout the day. But that evening, of course, everything changed. All of it, all the things they had thought out so meticulously, fell apart. At night, Jonas was forced to flee. He left the dwelling shortly after the sky became dark and the community became still. It was terribly dangerous because some of the work crews were still about, but he moved stealthily and silently, staying in the shadows, making his way past the darkened dwellings and the empty central plaza toward the river. Beyond the plaza, he could see the house of the old, with the annex behind it, outlined against the night sky. But he could not stop there. There was no time. Every minute counted now, and every minute must take him further from the community. Now he was on the bridge, hunched over on the bicycle, pedaling steadily. He could see the dark, churning water below. 
He felt surprisingly no fear, nor any regret at leaving the community behind. But he felt a deep sadness that he had left his closest friend behind, and he knew that in the danger of his escape he must be absolutely silent. But with his heart in mind, he called back and hoped that with his capacity for hearing beyond, the giver would know that Jonas had said goodbye. We don't know why he's left yet, right? So here's the story. It had happened at the evening meal. The family unit was eating together as always, Lily chattering away, mother and father making their customary comments and lies, now Jonas knew, about the day. Nearby, Gabriel played happily on the floor, babbling his baby talk, looking with glee now and then towards Jonas, obviously delighted to have him back after the unexpected night away from the dwelling. Father glanced down toward the toddler. Enjoy it, little guy, he said. This is your last night as a visitor. What do you mean, Jonas asked. Father sighed with disappointment. Well, you know, he wasn't here when you got home this morning because... We had him stay overnight at the nurturing center. It seemed like a good opportunity with you gone to give it a try. He'd been sleeping so soundly. Didn't it go well, Mother asked sympathetically. Father gave a rueful laugh. That's an understatement. It was a disaster. He cried all night, apparently. The night crew couldn't handle it. They were really frazzled by the time I got to work. Gabe, you naughty thing, Lily said with a scolding little cluck toward the grinning little toddler on the floor. So, Father went on, we obviously had to make the decision. Even I voted for Gabriel's release when we had the meeting this morning. Jonas put down his fork and stared at his father. Release, he asked. Father nodded. We certainly gave it our best try, didn't we? Yes, we did, Mother said emphatically. Lily nodded in agreement too. Jonas worked at keeping his voice absolutely calm. When, he asked, when will he be released? First thing tomorrow morning. We have to start our preparations for the naming ceremony, so we thought we'd get this taken care of right away. It's bye-bye to you, Gabe. In the morning, Father had said in his sweet sing-song voice. I don't like Father. What do you think? Jonas reached the opposite side of the river, stopped briefly, and looked back. The community where his entire life had been lived lay behind him now sleeping. At dawn, the orderly, disciplined life that he had always known would continue again without him. The life of where nothing was ever unexpected or inconvenient or unusual. The life without color, pain, or past. He pushed firmly again at his pedal with his foot and continued riding along the road. It was not safe to spend time looking back. He thought of the rules he had broken so far, enough that if he were caught now, he would be condemned. First, he had left the dwelling at, light at night, a major transgression. Second, he had robbed the community of food, a very serious crime, even though what he had taken was leftovers set out on the dwelling doorsteps for collection. Third, he, has stolen, he had stolen his father's bicycle. He had hesitated for a moment, standing beside the bike port, in the darkness, not wanting anything of his, father, of his father's, and uncertain as well, whether he could comfortably ride the largest bike when he was so accustomed to his own. But it was necessary. Think about this. Why was it necessary for him to have his father's bike? But it was necessary because it had the child seat attached to the back. And he had taken Gabriel, too. Oops. He could feel the little head nudge his back, bouncing gently against him as he rode. Gabriel was sleeping soundly, strapped into the seat. Before he had left the dwelling, he had laid his hands firmly on Gabe's back and transmitted to him the most soothing memory he could. A slow, swinging hammock, hammock under palm trees on an island someplace. At evening, with rhythmic music of languid water lapping hypnotically against a beach nearby. As the memory seeped from him into the new child, he could feel Gabe's sleep ease and deepen. There had been no stir at all when Jonas lifted him from the crib and placed him gently into the molded seat. He knew that he had the remaining hours of night before they would be aware of the escape. So he rode hard and steadily, willing himself not to tire as the minutes and miles passed. There had been no time to receive the memories that he and the giver had counted on, of strength and courage, 
so he relied on what he had and he hoped it would be enough. He circled the outlying communities, their dwellings dark. Gradually, the distances between communities widened with longer stretches of empty road. His legs ached at first and then as time passed, they became numb. At dawn, Gabriel began to stir. They were in an isolated field or place an isolated place, excuse me. Fields on either side of the road were dotted with thickets of trees here and there. He saw a stream and made his way to it across a rutted, bumpy meadow. Gabriel, wide awake now, giggled as the bike jolted him up and down. Jonas unstrapped Gabe, lifted him, for, lifted him from the bike, and watched him investigate the grass and twigs with delight. Carefully, he hid the bicycle in the thick bushes. Morning meal, Gabe, and he unwrapped some of the food and fed them both. Then he filled the cup that he had brought with water from the stream and held it for Gabriel to drink. He drank thirstily himself and sat by the stream, watching the new child play. He was exhausted. He knew he must sleep, resting his own muscles and preparing himself for more hours on the bicycle. It would not be safe to travel in the daylight. They would be looking for him soon. He found a place deeply hidden in the trees, took the new child there and lay down, holding Gabriel in his arms. He struggled cheerfully, or excuse me, Gabe struggled cheerfully, as if it were a wrestling game, the kind they had played back in the dwelling with tickles and laughter. Sorry, Gabe, Jonas told him, I know it's morning and I know you just woke up, but we have to sleep now. He cuddled the small boy close to him and rubbed his little back. He murmured to Gabriel smoothly, and then he pressed his hands firmly and transmitted a memory of deep, contented exhaustion. Gabriel's head nodded after a moment and fell against Jonas's chest. Together, the, fug the fugitives slept through the first dangerous day. The most terrifying thing was planes. By now, days had passed. Jonas no longer knew how many. The journey had become automatic. The sleep by day, hidden in underbrush and trees, the finding of water, the careful distribution of scraps of food, augmented by what he could find in the fields, and the endless, endless miles on his bicycle by night. His leg muscles were taut now. They ached when he settled himself to sleep, but they were stronger, and he stopped now often, or excuse me, stopped now less often to rest. Sometimes he paused and lifted Gabriel down for a brief bit of exercise, running down the road or through a field together in the dark, but always when he returned, strapped the uncomplaining toddler into the seat again and remounted and his legs were ready. So he had enough strength of his own and had not needed what the giver might have provided had there been time. But when the planes came, he wished he could have received more courage. He knew they were surge planes. They flew so low that they woke him with the noise of their engines. And sometimes looking out and up fearfully from the hiding places, he could almost see the faces of the searchers. He knew that they could not see color and that their flesh, as well as Gabriel's light golden curls, would be no more than smears of gray against the colorless foliage. But he remembered from his science and technology studies at school that the search planes use heat-seeking devices which could find body warmth and would hone in on two humans huddled in shrubbery. So always, when he heard the aircraft sound, he reached to Gabriel and transmitted memories of snow, keeping some for himself. Together, they became cold, and when the planes were gone, they would shiver, holding each other until they came to sleep again. Sometimes, urging the memories into Gabriel, Jonas felt that they were more shallow, a little weaker than they had been. It was what he had hoped, and what he and the giver had planned, that as he moved away from the community, he would shed the memories and leave them behind for the people. But now, when he needed them, when the planes came, he tried hard to cling to what he still had of cold, to use it for their survival. You sh Usually, the aircraft came by day and when they, were, when they were hiding, but he was alert at night too on the road, always listening intently for the sound of the engines. Even Gabriel listened and would call out, plane, plane, sometimes before Jonas, Jonas had heard the terrifying noise. When the aircraft searchers came, as they did occasionally during the night as they rode, 
Jonas sped to the nearest tree or bush, dropped to the ground, and made himself and Gabriel cold. But it was sometimes a frighteningly close call. As he pedaled through the nights, through isolated landscape now, with the communities far behind and no signs of human habitation around him or ahead, he was constantly vigil vigilant, looking for the next nearest hiding place, should the sounds of engines come. But the frequency of the planes diminished. They came less often and flew when they did come, less slowly, as if the search had become ha haphazard and no longer hopeful. Finally, there was an entire day and night when they did not come at all. All right, guys, tomorrow's our last day of The Giver. We have two chapters left. We'll see if they make it to elsewhere. Happy reading.